So good afternoon. Um, thank you, Cosman and Freya, for the invitation. Special thanks to Chutan and Jenny for the organizational support to make everything run smoothly. And thank you, Parasite, for your hospitality. Um, in light of the questions of urgency and crisis proposed by the conference, I'd like to provide a resolutely personal and discursive response, very much in the spirit of the independent scholarship and meanderings that would characterize today's panel. Next slide. Over the summer, as Documenta was learning from Athens, advocating for a process of unlearning and re-examination using Greece as a metaphor situated between its elevated status in classical antiquity and the discourse of Western thought and its recent ordeal in a locally manifested global crisis, I was doing a little bit of learning from Athens of my own. Following New York University's archaeological program in Selinunte, directed by Professor Clemente Maconi, digging from 5th century BCE all the way down to 7th century BCE over the course of six weeks in a temple that's part of an Acropolis built on the then uh, Greek colony. So on the upper right corner was close to the last week or even last day of us digging very, very deep in the trench. And on the left side um, of the upper right image, I would rather, I'd rather have you control it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can see the layers, almost like cakes, as we go down the different uh, uh, stratas of the archaeological exploration. Um, this place is extremely scenic. And uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, and on a fine, clear day, past the strones hovering above uh, the site, and also, the more humble tools we use to sift, transport, and categorize our findings, you can actually make out the island of Pantelleria in the distance. You can't see it here, but sometimes we can see that on the distance. This is a famous tourist destination, as well as one of the refugee, uh, one for the refugee boats that made way across the Mediterranean. Uh, there's a bit of fascination overload when working in a locale fraught with such rich historical and geopolitical complexities. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, from its capture by the Carthaginians, uh, on the image on the lower left, I have a map of the um, ancient uh, Carthage uh, map. Fascist propaganda that ordered hasty resurrections of temples that, fallen, that had fallen in earthquakes to today's seafaring routes of refugees, which is on the right. One particular route, as mentioned by scholar Dina Ramadan, was taken in 1903 by Imam Muhammad Abdo, Egypt's Grand Mufti, uh, which is the foremost interpreter of Islamic law, who embarked on an extended trip to Europe um, that ended in Sicily. Throughout his travels, um, Abdul visited monuments, museums, churches, ce uh, cemeteries, botanic gardens, archives, and libraries. Um, he wrote a series of lengthy articles, anonymous letters about his adventures. The most quoted of Abdul's writings from this trip is an entry titled Images and Statues, Their Benefits and Legality, which has generally been considered his fatwa, which is the legal judgment in support of representational art. Um, when they engage education rather than idolatry. At the same time, Ramadan argues, uh, Abdul's trip also took on the dimension in search of an Arabic past, citing Arabic monuments and book collections in cities like Palermo, highlighting um, to his readers that Arab influence and presence in Europe uh, were long, uh, had a long historical trajectory while mourning the current state of the Arabs. His legal ruling, can we go to the next slide? His legal ruling on the permissibility of images connects at a very crucial moment to um, a long historical negotiation of figurative form uh, on, the, on the left side, which is a very interesting case where mosaics were uh, carefully removed um, from a fully figurative form to something that's almost uh, like a ghostly appearance, uh, semi-abstract form, um, to the self-essentializing practices of religious extremist groups that quite strategically deploy 
politics of image for self-legitimization. And on the right is the image that we're all very familiar with, uh, where ISIS soldiers destroyed classical antiquities. Here is the interesting question. In this dynamic constellation of political, cultural, and historical registers, where can you safely place the other? I don't think you can, either in Hellenistic times nor in 2017. And I think we need to be very, very cautious in um, the notions, in thinking about notions of unlearning and deprofessionalization before we even have a solid, consensual grasp of elementary history let alone the continuous efforts through which the past is revis revisited and excavated. Uh, can we go to the next slide? During my time digging in Salonunte, a friend of mine, a young Chinese person like me who went abroad for college, visited from London, and I was particularly awestruck when he told me that Chinese students nowadays in London are increasingly majoring in African studies, which was unthinkable for the time we were applying to colleges in the US in the mid-2000s. Majoring art history as I did was considered very unconventional, and many people chose more pragmatic and more financially viable majors like mathematics and economics. The noticeable change in pragmatic choices like college major selection clearly mirrors a broader paradigm shift, namely the extensive economic exchange and cross-immigration between China and Africa. Uh, on the right uh, is a pretty widely circulated New York Times article that offered a glimpse of what may be the largest global trade and investment spree in history. Uh, quote, driven by economics, uh, hunger for resources and new markets and politics, a longing for strategic allies, Chinese companies and workers have rushed into all parts of the world. In 2000, only five countries counted China as their largest trading partner. Today, more than 100 countries do, from Australia to the United States. The drumbeat of proposed projects never stops. A military operation base, uh, China's first overseas in Djibouti, um, a 8 billion high-speed railway through Nigeria, an almost fantastical canal across uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua expected to cost $50 billion. Even as China's boom slows down, its most ambitious scheme is still ramping up. With the One Belt, One Road initiative, just in time for the 19th uh, you know, Communist Party congressional meeting today, uh, its name, a reference to trade routes, uh, President Xi Jinping has spoken of putting 1.6 trillion over the next decade into infrastructure and development throughout Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. The scheme would dwarf the United States post-war, post-Second World War uh, Marshall Plan for Europe. At the same time, um, can we go to the next slide? Immigration of Africans to China uh, present provocative new parameters in which identity, geopolitics, and the imaginary other are reformulated. Loaded discourses on blackness and racism in Euro-American contexts find unprecedented digressions and diversions, and the fraught, unstable grounds are already attracting thoughtful investigation from the artists. Uh, these uh, images we're looking at is actually from a project by the American artist Daniel Traub, who, uh, can we go to the next slide, who encountered uh, two uh, kind of itinerant Chinese photographers taking portraits for African immigrants in Guangzhou in the Little North Road, uh, where uh, it's a city where uh, a huge number of African immigrants first appeared and started uh, dis causing stirs in the public discourse. And can we go to the next slide? Uh, many of you may be familiar with this work. We're looking at some stills from artist Hu Xiangtian's The Sun in 2008, a durational performance piece in which the artist tanned himself to achieve a certain shade of blackness. The work was inspired by the increasing presence of African immigrants in southern city, Chinese city, Guangzhou, where the artist was trained and based for many years, while the nonchalant gesture conveyed a constellation of attitudes, fascination, bewilderment, and perhaps ignorance, yet one not to be confused with historically entrenched and institutionalized uh, racism, say, in America. We can contrast the series, um, uh, Hu Xiangtian's work, to the next slide. A series of works, uh, self-portrait as Mao Zedong, in 2013 by the Cameroonian artist Samuel Fossil, 
Faso transformed uh, himself through cosmetics and stagecraft to enact several iconic portraits of Mao. Can we go to the next slide? Yet left his own facial features prominently on display with dissonant elements imbe embedded. Uh, on the one, the image on the left clearly shows uh, Mao wearing a red armband reading Africa uh, or replacing the communist uh, iconography with a silhouette of, of the African continent on the red flag, which is an image that will come up in later slides, uh, conjuring up rich historical context in which Mao oscillates between an inspiration for liberation movements in the global south and an embodiment of a new quasi-colonial ambition. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So these are some of other uh, fossils work where he dressed himself up as prominent uh, black leaders. On the, on the left, we have Martin Luther King and on the right, the famous, uh, he's reenacting the famous Esquire cover of Muhammad Ali, uh, which was further inspired by St. Sebastian, uh, a, a very famous Renaissance trope. And can we go to the next one? And this is where you see um, the African continental uh, silhouette replacing what would have been a communist or a Chinese iconography. And what's quite striking to me is also he doesn't quite shy away from showing his own features, especially on the image on the left. We know that he's trying to um, embody or portray and perform the Chinese leader, but at the same time he's own features are prominently displayed at the same time. And then it prompted me to think that it is utterly unproductive to look at these works through the perspectives of yellow face, black face, and the increasingly uh, narrow discourse of cultural appropriation. It is impossible to reconcile what is emotionally safe with what can be intellectually provocative. Outrage over cultural appropriation should never focus on the private privatization and ownership of certain discourses, histories, and experiences, but on the ignorance and lack of imagination to ask newer, more provocative questions, to seek nuance and cracks on seemingly hard divisions. It is in a similar vein in which I have argued that we need to be wary of the discourse of representation and self-representation when we think about emerging discourses such as the post-internet or Asian futurism because the best speculative thinking often isn't anthropocentric, let alone racially oriented. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, sometimes we're all faceless metadata embedded in a mega scale flow of the capital. This is the uh, Okonoma series by Angolan artist Edison Chagas, who presented uncanny self-portraitures um, in which the artist's face is completely covered by a variety of packaging materials bearing clear linguistic and graphic identities of economic entities present in Angola, such as one from a Chinese fertilizing company. Those of you who can read Chinese, this is a very comical kind of self-portrait. Um, can we go to the next slide? Another kind of more problematic trait is not lost on the Chinese artist He Xiangyu. In his half-fictional, half-documentary video, Wu Tiao, which is still ongoing, he follows a group of young Africans recruited to learn acrobatic skills in the famous circus town, uh, which is where the name of the work came from, not too far away from Beijing, exploring their training, integration, religious practices, as well as the mechanism that engineer their displacement. Uh, can we go to the next slide? This is a very striking uh, image from the Wu Tiao work where we have a flying young uh, African teen who, are, who is catapulted over a, a typical slogan that is touted around, especially during the Olympics or international uh, sports tournament, which literally translates into winning glory for the country. But which country are we speaking about here? Um, the two pairings uh, of you know, Chinese and African artists who are, reflected in, who are reflecting on this new identity uh, constitute a curatorial project of mine opening early next month, which is, can we go to the next slide? This is held in the James B. Duke House where the Institute of Fine Arts of NYU is located. Um, the exhibition plays off the building's historical significance. Uh, it's you know, right across the street from the Metropolitan Museum. Um, decorative and architectural style and the institute's engagement with critical discourse on art. 
But the real goal here, of course, is to radically expand current reflections on highly, highly contested issues like identity and race by incorporating a volatile new context and geopolitical condition not directly mediated by the West nor dictated by its colonial legacy. Uh, excuse the shoddy Photoshop work. It's, it's not even Photoshop, it's just layered on top of it. The exhibition will be accompanied by a very loose, a casual, but rigorous roundtable and a screening program that challenges today's popular or even populist yet problematically narrow discourse on identity politics and self-representation from and beyond this bi bilateral condition. Can we go to the next slide? So we were talking about yesterday that Africa is not a country, and it just so happened that one of my favorite blogs on contemporary African affairs played directly off that misconception. Uh, the blog's name is Africa is a Country, but it, apparently it's very ironic. What's more exciting for me, um, on the right side, I don't know if you can read very clearly, um, is one of its subtopics, soccer is a country, um, where politics, capital, nationalism, and private passion find the perfect arena. Um, if you think about it, the soccer pitch is the ultimate neoliberal spectacle with a very sizable public, the kind of real international public that those of us in the art world would desire but cannot hope to fully engage. What's more important, at least to me personally, is that the soccer community represents a superstructure that stack on top of traditional boundaries of geography and nationalism, while at the same time making them much, much more accessible. At least that was um, my own experience. Um, can we go to the next slide? The most insightful artists in our field have, or, have always been uh, paying attention, like Haram Faraki, uh, who made uh, the 2006 World Cup final his subject in a 2007 work titled Deep Play. The events held in Germany was reportedly seen by an estimated 1.5 billion viewers worldwide. Unfolding in simultaneous real-time montage, Deep Play calibrates the artist's own footage of the game, official FIFA footage, charts of um, player stats, real-time 2D and 3D animation sequences, and stadium surveillance to expose the visual, informational, and technological design of these grand cultural spectacles. Um, the network of images and data stages a reprocessed disarticulation of spectacle, aptly pointing out the present conditions of visuality and its overwhelming influence on representation and subjectivity. According to Haraki himself, um, the, in, the interest also came from the understanding that there, quote, there are few events that attract as many cameras. So much human intelligence focused on a few hundred squares, a uh, hundred square meters of grass. In the end, these industries do the same thing with soccer as they do with factories and battlefields, unquote. Um, can we go to the next slide? Those of us who are passionate about the game can certainly relate in a way um, that it has fundamentally transformed our perception and pr uh, processing of images and how we operate within the world um, populated and overpopulated by them. And in the words of Gigi Buffon, who is featured on the right, one of the world's top rated goalkeepers, um, who also sounded remarkably like a new media artist in a 2005 interview, uh, quote, the spectators, this is so brilliant, I'm just going to quote this whole passage, uh, paragraph. The spectators of a football game can have diverse characters or qualities and be spread out in different spaces, countries, and situations. Some people go to the stadium, but in general they watch the game on television or listen to the radio or read the newspaper. In this sense, the audience is not fixed in space or time. It also depends on the distribution of the information, whether it's live at the stadium, I'm right, right? He sounds like a new media artist. Or on TV, where the story has already been transformed by the camera work, editing, and the narration of sports commentators who, who explain the movement of the game. I have always been very curious about this real-time narration made up of a sequence of names and numbers, directions, strategies, predictions. It has a specific vocabulary and rhythm, very technical, but also full of prefabricated remarks and stocked with players' nicknames, deliberate descriptions, and quips." Unquote. He would go on to speculate on his own subjectivity in the grand scheme of the spectacle. Quote, I am responsible for intercepting the ball at a crucial moment, 
he's he's absolutely right. That's how he's usually portrayed and um, promote uh, and and presented on promotional materials and even honorary ones. The records of my actions are minimal. Repetitions of the climatic moments, whether they're mistakes or achievements. I have the idea that although a man's life is compounded of thousands and thousands of moments and days, those many instants and days can be reduced to a single one. So my single image in the media is precisely about the moment when I try to stop the ball. They're all stills of instantaneous decisions. At the end of the day, it is a collection of images where I always appear in midair, flying. I like it that the entire record of my life is of it occurring in the air. I am amazed that I can watch an image of myself at the precise moment uh, when I'm trying to catch the ball. I'm catching the ball and the media is trying to catch my image. The difference is that they are bombarding me with their cameras and I have a single chance. They will always capture me, I will always fail. Later, the same instant is broadcast from different angles at different speeds, slow motion still backward and forward. Uh, speech also supports the image. They talk about my career, my common mistakes and virtues, all the statistics around my movements, how many balls I stopped in my life, how many I have let through, unquote. Sorry for the very long quote, but I decided it was just too brilliant not to share. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, and this is just a, a throwing in another work by Jaco Gordon and Philippe Pirano, uh, who zoomed in on Zinedine Zidane, who is one of the most celebrated French uh, soccer players um, you know, in the last two decades, probably, um, who also played a prominent role in the 2006 uh, World Cup in Germany that was the subject of Harun Faraki. And for those of you who are soccer fans, he famously headbutted um, a, a player in the opposing team, which effectively um, earned him a red card and he was sent off stage in a very uh, crucial game uh, for friends. And can we go to the next slide? And so this is another work that I thought really um, would really make more sense when it taps into the prominence of the game um, in different cultural contexts. Um, this is uh, Mustafa Benfoldi's piece. It has not. It has no importance, uh, which was quickly staged and then censored in the 2010 or 11 Shaja Biennial. It consists of 23 headless uh, mannequins dressed in soccer uniforms installed outside in a public courtyard behind a prominent mosque. As part of the work, Arabic graffiti painted on the walls of the courtyard. Um, there's also a text printed on the mannequin's white t-shirt. This is the opposing team, not the one uh, I'm describing here. There's sexually explicit and anti-government and police messages. One of the shirts is printed with a poem in both Arabic and English that is also sexually explicit um, and references Allah. Can we go to the next slide? And on the left is a new documentary that just came out on uh, Netflix that followed Le Bleu, the uh, French national team, for 20 years, from 1996 to 2016. Um, and it does a really good job of uh, narrating the successes and setbacks of the national team um, in the way that it mirrored transformations in the French society. Um, how this whole idea of, um, if I remember correctly, black, uh, blanc, and beurre, which means black, white, and Arabic, um, went through um, this really rocky road from an emblem of pride to a kind of highlight of problem uh, that many used to fault um, the French national team. And what has always fascinated me when I look at um, these international specta uh, spectator sports is that the, the, these, these are one of the very few arenas you see the open display and juxtapositions of very contradicting ideologies, either political or religious. And on the top, on the two images on the right, uh, you know, we have pious Christian players, and then we also have um, Muslim players who are openly praying on the pitch, and yet they are oftentimes really close friends and teammates in real life. Can we go to the next slide? And I think this is the same spirit that I find um, artists like Angela Washko, who went into you know gaming worlds. Uh, this is the uh, 
War of Warcraft. It's you know it's one of the um, really popular video games where she uh, would go in and engage the players um, in discussions about feminism and uh, you know objectification of women, especially in the gaming industry. Um, can we go to the next slide? It is equally wrong, I think, to assume that those embroils in all of these um, uh, spectacles and uh, public spaces like the soccer stadium or the gaming world are without agency. Um, and uh, one of the really fascinating subcultural phenomenon that I have been uh, looking into a little bit over the past two, three years is the kind of um, slash or fan fiction written by straight women uh, who are projecting the, their desires on straight, uh, very straight uh, male players. And uh, this is a comparison that uh, just got stuck on my mind. On the left, we have two uh, really great players of the Italian national team in a very passionate embrace, but they're also kind of exhausted after uh, a long game. And they were celebrating, but they were also kind of beaten up, but at the same time, I think the camera really captures and fixated on their physical beauty and the emotional charged moment of that um, celebration. And then it reminded me of you know, earlier works by David Hockney, who in the 60s were making explicit uh, references to his um, homosexuality, and he would use code, very coded ways of um, talking about his own relationship um, to prominent uh, poets and other uh, figures, uh, other prominent cultural figures. And can we go to the next slide? And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, what fan fiction or slash fiction is, these are mostly same-sex male romances and erotic, erotica written mostly by and for women. And this is a very interesting example I found online. Uh, featuring Zizek and uh, Lacan as the protagonists. And if you read a little bit of this, it's very self-conscious, but then you get the idea that it's really uh, written for an audience that's already in the know, that already know the existing structure and the dynamics, and then it plays off that sometimes, um, and sometimes intentionally, superficially. So, you know, it started with a very funny tone. It was a dark and stormy night. Boy, was it a dark, stormy night. Um, so I think basically the story it, it just borrows the characters of uh, you know famous philosophers um, and use that to talk about a very cliched romantic um, relationship. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, and there's th this whole subcultural phenomenon. Um, of course, had a pretty long history by now. What? What's wrong? Oh, wow. Sorry. Maybe that was too steamy for this context. Um, uh, but on the left, there's a really interesting collection of essays uh, edited by um, Antonia Levy et al. Uh, that touched upon this, um, this kind of subcultural genre of literary practice and comic book practice. Um, specifically in the Japanese and American context, um, and tracing historical precedents of same-sex relationships to tale of Genji and familiar tropes of amorous affairs between Buddhist monks and their acolytes. Um, can we go to the next slide? This is actually one of my favorite works in the Metropolitan Museum in the Japanese art collection. And uh, you know, similarly narrated um, a story of a young acolyte and a Buddhist monk and how uh, this sort of erotic desire became a rite of passage to enlightenment. But at the same time, it really elaborated on the beauty and um, of that relationship. Um, so can we go to the next slide? OK, so this is um, a very popular Japanese manga called Captain Tsubasa, which was uh, published in 1985, a self-published manga who uh, work based on the popular um, uh, discourse about boys' football and um, kind of really became a central uh, theme in a lot of the fan fiction works. And just a little bit more um, on the fan fiction history in Japan. 
Uh, usually, um, it has become more or less a commercialized production uh, with fan-created works, and uh, which contributed to the genre of yayoi, a sardonic acronym for no climax, no point, no meaning that characterized short snippets of sexually or romantically uh, charged encounters. Uh, usually, uh, these are spin-offs of existing stories and characters. So in the Chinese context, um, at least in the really interesting writings that I've sampled myself, uh, because after the last World Cup ended, I had a real emotional need for more of soccer. And then, you know, when you started Googling, just one place leads to another, and then you make a new fascinating discovery. Um, in the Chinese context, there seems to be a, I, I would say, a democratic erotica practiced by a growing number of internet writers who are mostly female, anonymous, and amateur in the past decade. In the format of slash fiction, um, a genre that I think, especially in their practice, radically feminist in its uninhibited expression of imagined desire, um, you know, usually between straight men, which is perhaps in response to the crippled agency of female characters in mainstream fiction and pop culture, and already exerting real influence in the entertainment industry um, in phenomenon that some of us might be familiar with called queer baiting. Um, due to the nature of the genre, these writings are often too niche to be commercially viable, um, but the participation is wide and passionate. Gender is not only fluid, but also creative. I have learned that there is a sixth gender system um, in some of the most hardcore erotic writing, usually to serve erotic ends between same sexes. Also, the changing platforms um, like BBS, Weibo, Lofter, on which this kind of writing thrived, um, dodged censorship, and recodified its language, uh, make equally compelling stories. Uh, this part is a little bit jumbled because I'm actually writing on something about this and trying to work my way through. And can we go to the next uh, slide? Uh, if you think that the kind of slash fiction and subcultural response to grander cultural and capitalist spectacles is uh, very, on the, very much on the margin, uh, I would uh, argue with the last case study I will show that even in the center of the art world and with practitioners in the center, um, of their respective fields, there are huge areas of unexplored um, trajectories and histories. And we're looking at a painting by the American artist Mark Tenzi in 1984. Um, this is a work called Action Painting, so you get his um, satirical bent here. Uh, he's using the language of realism to uh, comment and even uh, make fun, irrever irreverent fun of abstract expressionism and the elevated status of abstraction um, you know, in the New York uh, art world. Can we go to the next slide? And this is a brochure featuring an essay that he wrote um, that accompanied a small private studio exhibition he did for four Chinese artists in 1994. Um, as many of you probably know, during the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of Chinese artists went through New York and for different periods of time, and they established lively and intimate communities, um, not only among themselves, but with international artists who were practicing um, and working there for however long uh, their stay was. And these communities sustained uh, their burgeoning practices, functioning both as an underground economy and an intellectual hub. Uh, apartments, studios, and basements became vibrant nexuses before institutions um, uh, came, uh, came in to historicize and then um, showcase uh, their practices. And uh, Ai Weiwei has made extensive photographic record of friends and acquaintances. And Xu Bing has written an, a brilliant essay called East Village 52 7th Street Basement that offered very flavorful and informative glimpses of this kind of uh, community that these artists had. Um, Chinese artist Zhang Peili has made installations in the apartment of art other artists in the early 1990s. Uh, professional connections were formed, opportunities for day jobs and other paying gigs were shared. Um, countless exchanges materialized into discourse, camaraderie, and collaborative work. Um, during my uh, initial visits to artist studios and personal archives, 
uh, I wanted to look deep, more deeply into the practices of artists who spent time in New York, Chinese artists, it soon became apparent that there are substantial amount of unpublished original work, unofficial publications, and oral histories that will expand and challenge ex uh, existing narratives of both individual practice and the various parameters that have informed them. Uh, can we go to the next slide? This is um, a work by Chen Danqing from this period. And when he, by the time he arrived in New York in the early 80s, he was already quite established. OK, five minutes. He was already quite established um, in China as a, you know, a painter who practiced in the realism idiom. But after he came to New York, he would write this repeatedly in his personal accounts that he immediately realized that there's nothing he can do um, in New York in the context at that time. Whatever he was trained in and found success in uh, would not, is already outdated and would not be able to um, thrive. And so he would, made, he would make repeated trips to the Metropolitan Museum and then um, just render after old master paintings. And so this is a deeply personal or even autobiographical work where he painted his own boots, leather boots and leather shoes in the style of Van Gogh even, uh, that commented on that struggle that he had experienced. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, you can run through the next three or four. Yes, uh, that's Ai Weiwei, by the way. Can we go back two slides? A never before published sketchbook featuring over 40 sketches and pre preparatory drawings for larger paintings by Liu Xiaodong, uh, a now very well known and commercially successful uh, Chinese artist, testified to a keen engagement with New York's urban sensibilities, uh, cinematic vernacular, and new figural approaches seen the works of, uh, by artists such as Eric Fischel. He also painted artists working together. Um, lounging about at CBGB or casually hanging out uh, among themselves. So um, the Mark Tenzi exhibition that I uh, talked about in the beginning um, was an instance where the artist uh, showcased Liu Xiaodong's canvases, uh, including the one that I uh, showed two slides. Can we go back to that slide? And the previous one. Um, with uh, works by Chen Danqing, Yu Hong, and Ni Jun, accompanied by a really short and thoughtful essay by Tenzi himself that offered valuable insights into the work's critical reception by a sympathetic fellow artist working in different contexts and lineages of the painterly and realism. Um, this sort of small um, Studio exhibition will, again, in the spring, be restaged as an archive show at the Duke House at NYU IFA. Uh, I'm going to go off my script because I'm running out of time. So can you keep going? Um, this is uh, Yu Hong's work uh, in this period. Uh, very free-spirited self-portraits, often in naked. Uh, next one. This is Ni Jun's work from 1991 called North Korea. This is oil painting. Um, that is informed by photographic sources as well as the artist's own research into the political climate at the time. And there's a very interesting catch that this work is painted over an unwanted painting by Ai Weiwei. So if you x-ray this work, there's another maybe more expensive work underneath. Um, can we go to the next slide? And just last week, as I, was as I was interviewing Tenzi, I realized that there's another missing connection. And we're looking at um, a work by the Russian dual, um, why am I blanking out on their name? Um, Vitaly, sorry? Komar yes, Komar Malamit, um, who actually was the, the link that connected Tenzi to the Chinese artist. And now we have a full, I think, picture of this camaraderie of a figurative diaspora, you know, uh, the Russian uh, socialist realism uh, tradition that filtered through China that fundamentally influenced the Chinese artist, and then Tenzi recognizing that they come, uh, that these artists were practicing uh, from very different registers of aesthetic and historical um, experiences, and then uh, valuing uh, the heterogeneous nature of the practice of realism rather than um, I think dusting them off as something art history has already cast aside. Um, can we go to the next slide? 
Right. Um, and so in the next, th I have one minute, but I have, I have three uh, last comparisons or juxtapositions to make, uh, which is that even in art historical narrative, as well as in the way images are circulated, um, edited and post-edited, there is a very erratic logic sometimes to the way they make sense and come to us. Um, and it just compels and behooves us to use increasingly new um, and creative methodologies to investigate them. So on the left uh, is kind of a gif from the video from artist Lu Yan, who was investigating on the neurological structures um, that give a representation or appearances to the affective dimensions of religious deity. So again, you know, where does God or religion plays in contemporary and secular life. And it, it traffics in the same kind of um, image logic as the image cover for Modern Weaponry, which is a, a state-owned magazine that looks at uh, you know, weapons. But on the cover, it's actually uh, tapping into the subculture of um, anthropomorphed uh, kawaii girls who embody different battleships in the Second World War. And I imagine the editors, when putting this on their cover, was not aware of that trajectory and how amazingly uh, disjuncted the outcome is. Um, the next one. This is the second to last one. I, I know my time is up, but I'll try to make it very quickly. Uh, on the right, I guess we can't really see it very clearly, but this is one of the earlier uh, Frank Stella, uh, black canvases. And it just occurred to me as I was looking at that at the Whitney Muse Museum the other day that sometimes um, when we compare um, images and artworks side by side, uh, the, the visual cues are no longer, I think, the most prominent clues. On the left, we have um, a work by the Chinese painter Liao Guohe, who is sometimes categorized in the bad painter category, but he really is speaking to the erra erratic logic of images and new linguistics in this post-internet um, age of, uh, but especially in the context of China, we're looking at uh, the swirl of different kinds of uh, money, and this is a literal visualization of three characters, uh, money, clout, meat, but then they directly translate, translate into a name um, of a Chinese, um, I would say, village head who was brutally crushed um, in, um, in, a, in a scheme. And then on the right, we have Frank Stella's painting uh, that he wanted to foreground the object, the objecthood of the work, but at the same time, the title of the work is Hoist the Flag um, in German, um, which is taken from uh, the Nazi uh, marching uh, song. So, you know, the tenuous, but the tenuous, but also very charged relationships between what's visual and what's being referenced um, is, I think, makes these two works more comparable than other kinds of comparisons. And so the last work, uh, returning to a Buddhist mode. And again, uh, the work on the left is Nanjun Paik's TV Buddha. Um, he, was, he made this work probably at a moment when artists were thinking very critically about the ontology of New, newer technology, newer um, technologies and imaging uh, formats like the TV, but on the right is the kind of very shoddy and pirated um, manga series in China where people would jumble, you know, the Monkey King with the Transformers, um, but sometimes make really fascinating stories. And in it, we see the Transformer donning uh, a Buddhist garment, and he's saying that I have already put down my weapons and I'm, you know, on my way to enlightenment. And this is incredibly funny when you encounter this kind of images and they represent radically different logics uh, when interesting and I think research worthy or just exciting images um, come into uh, my personal filter or screen. And since I'm on a Buddhist note here, I wanted to go back to one of my favorite soccer fan fiction writers uh, when, who also evoked a Buddhist trope in one of her writings where she commented on um, how her favorite team made to the World Cup final but her favorite player has 
in three consecutive World Cups, that's 12 years, uh, failed to make the elimination round because of personal injuries. And she was incredibly happy about the success, but also for the team, but also uh, pained by the personal tragedy of this player. And she said that she evoked the Buddhist trope of the Shumi mountain and the mustard seed. Uh, the, teaching, the Buddhist teaching goes that uh, we know that a mountain can, um, in, can include a seed in it, but it's hard to imagine a seed, a tiny mustard seed, encompassing a whole mountain. But in the Buddhist teaching, that relativity somehow works. And in the way she wrote about it, she was talking about how you can have, at the same time, an extreme amount of euphoric joy, and at the same time, deeply um, tragedy um, without, each, without them eclipsing each other, but in a way they're mutually enhancing. And I think that's a very apt um, analogy for, I think, the rich spectrum um, that inhabit places between dichotomies, you know, the norm and the other, um, the West and the East, and all of these dichotomies that we're so tired of, but somehow still uh, have to go back to. Um, but I do think that, you know, just like the Buddhist trope that she evoked, uh, we should have the capacity to encompass uh, contradictions and nuance at the same time. Um, uh, and just going back to the archaeological um, story that I began, um, I realized that there were, I always thought that we have exhausted um, all kinds of archaeological sites, especially when it comes to Greek and Roman art. But on the site that we're excavating, it's about maybe 5 to 10% uh, being excavated. And there's a huge unexplored area. And I think it's the same for the field uh, that we are working in. Um, and my response to the general theme of this conference is that I would not dwell on problems when there are so many interesting works to be done. Thank you. <laughs>